listening to Into the Arena, a Hunger Games podcast sparking the fandom one episode at a time, with your hosts, Holly and Emily. Special thanks for music by Sam Cushion. Welcome back, Tributes, to Into the Arena. I'm Holly. And I'm Emily. And today, we are so excited to finally get to our ballad debrief. We've been waiting weeks to do it, and here we are. Um, But first, before we get to that, we have a big announcement. Next week, on March 20th, at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will be doing a Hunger Games Watch Along Live on Instagram. Yay! So follow our account at Into the Arena Podcast um, just to celebrate how many years will it be? Nine? Nine. Nine years since the first movie came out. So come visit us and hang out. It's going to be a fun Saturday night. And in the meantime, make sure that you're also following all our social media accounts, um, our TikTok, YouTube, um, our Facebook page, and our Instagram, which I already shouted out, at Into the Arena Podcast. But before you get into our ballad talk, this week we're going to be doing a fun pregame. And we're going to be doing my favorite again, which is Would You Rather, but it's going to be ballad inspired. So I'll go ahead and kick us off. Holly, would you rather have to sing at the hob with a covey or catch Jabber Jays with Sejanus? Ooh, um, <laughs> that's a good one because I can't sing at all so it would probably be a disaster I figured <laughs> <laughs> I would be so bad um and it just does not sound fun to hang out with snow honestly so those are both equally bad but I think I would pick sing with the covey at the hall because then I can just play like background vocals. I could lip sync with them. <laughs> It'll be like pretty low key. No, Sejanus though, not Snow. Oh, with Sejanus. I thought you said Snow for some reason. I was like, well, oh, I guess what? Snow is there. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> mm. You're right. Snow is, snow is a better would you rather. So let's go with that. With so snow, well, it. then I was going to change my <laughs> answer. If it's with Sejanus, I'm like, obviously I want to hang out with him. Who wouldn't? So that's what I'd be if it was Sejanus, but with Snow, I'm like, get that man away from me. He is a narcissist. No, thank you. I really wouldn't want to sing. So even if it was Snow, I think I would still pick hanging out with Snow because I do not, I do not want to be singing in front of people. You can just think. (laughs) But if it's Sejanus, I would do anything with that boy. So time with him. (laughs) That's what, that's what I'm so excited for is when he finally gets casted. So then I can like, have an idea like a better idea of who he is and what he looks like for the movie so because we all love him he's perfect oh my gosh I can't wait they better (laughs) cast him right amen my question is um they take place at two different times so different points of your life okay and you're a capital citizen so would you rather be one of Dr. Gall's TAs while you're a student at university or um school or would you rather later be President Snow's assistant during his president years? Mm, I'm going to have to say President Snow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no, like, Dr. Gall is doing some messed up stuff that I, I it's just sick and twisted. Not that President Snow isn't, but I feel like I could just be working on some paperwork or something like that. Mm-hmm. something simple something more in the background whereas with Dr. Gull it just seems so intense yeah so I, like, I don't think I don't think I could be around Dr. Gull yeah I think I would say the same because after everything that happened I'm like uh, I'm scared I'm gonna be a mutt because of you <laughs> she's just psychotic um but yeah that was a very dark one <laughs> Okay, so my second would you rather is extremely similar to yours that you just said. Um, I was going to ask you if you were to live in Panem and either had to have President Snow as the president or have Dr. Gall as the president, who would you pick? I think President Snow. Like, that's so awful. 
and yeah, we know same. what he does with his presidency but I don't know I think everyone would be like turning into some weird spider or snake or something like that like if you crossed them at all so yeah I feel like it's a, a bit less fantastical of a world if you pick snow I know that's what I was thinking too I mean we'll probably get into it more but there's definitely just kind of the villains in yeah. both the trilogy and then in Ballad, Dr. Gull is just so intense. Yeah, definitely. I had two more because I was like coming up with some fun ones. Um, would you rather die before you got into the arena, like the 11 other tributes just like randomly mm-hmm. die before they got there? Or would you at least like to have a chance at surviving against 13 other people, but potentially die in the awful ways that they did? I think the, I think I'd want a chance. I mean, I don't think I would have one, but I couldn't, I couldn't say to myself, oh, there's no hope. Mm -hmm. So let's just, let's just end it right here. Yeah. Cause I mean, like if maybe it would have been like a faster death outside is what I was going for because they just died in some random ways but um the ones in in this games I found a lot harder to read than I did reading the original series which I found kind of fascinating just brutal okay so what was what was your last one okay my last one I feel like I wrote it and I liked it but I felt like I know which one you'd pick so the last one because you know me and what who would you be in an alliance with my questions always come up would you rather be the district partner slash ally of Lucy or Sejanus? <laughs> I always do that. Okay, I feel like Sejanus might be to me what what Peta is. Yeah. To you. I just love Sejanus so much, and I just want to spend like you said about Peta. I just want to mm-hmm. spend some time with Sejanus. Oh my god, I knew it. <laughs> See, I'm so happy that we both found our Hunger Games soulmates in this series. Like. I have PETA, you have Sejanus. It's just perfect, perfect, perfect double date. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Can we go on a double date? That sounds so great. Guys, we've been in quarantine way too long talking about dating. (laughs) Let's plan out a whole date, us four. (laughs) It's fine. Oh gosh, this is is my dream. Yeah, our ENFPs. Oh my goodness. That was was the one I knew who you would pick. Oh, I thought I knew. Would you pick... So Janus as well, or? I think no. I would. I think I would pick him because he is like Peta's copy. You know what I mean? Like he's very similar to Peta. And Lucy, I don't know if I trust Lucy. So I'm still getting to know her character, I think. Okay, um, cool. That was fun. Yeah. I'm glad we finally get to talk about ballad characters. Also, I know. if people haven't picked up on this, which we'll probably mention again at the, go back and mention at the beginning, this is a spoiler filled episode. So don't just, go any Just skip this one. Yeah. <laughs> come back to it because we are going to be talking about everything in the book. So we warned you. But I guess that leads us in to our our main segment of this whole show, which we have been waiting for for a long time, is our ballad talk. So maybe we should start with like what was your reaction when you heard that the book was even going to be published, that it was even yeah. a thing. Yeah, I guess for me, um, I remember I was at work and I saw the little announcement, the teaser announcement that they had. And I was like, oh my gosh, wait, what? There's going to be another book. And at the time we didn't know like what the book was going to be about. Mm-hmm. And so I was so excited. I think every Hunger Games fan was just so pumped because maybe it's Hamish, maybe it's Finnick. I don't know. Maybe it's post Mockingjay. The world is full of opportunities. And then it changed. I remember finding out that it was going to be a snow book. I remember taking a screenshot. Like I have the screenshot from when I had that, found that announcement. And I literally went, Are you joking? I texted my mom. I was like, this is a joke. Um, I don't know if I'm going to read it, even though I knew I was going to read it. But (laughs) (laughs) I was like, of all people. But what did you think? What was your first reaction? I think I saw it on Facebook 
first I saw that yeah that image of the untitled Mm -hmm. Panem novel oh gosh I was just so excited I never thought that we would get anything else in the world of the Hunger Games like I was convinced did you think it was a possibility no no yeah me either I was like there's there's no way there's no chance she's already told the story that she wanted to tell Mm -hmm. and I never thought there would be anything I thought it was going to be about I I did not think it was going to be about Finnick or Hamish there was just there was just no way I thought it would be totally new characters related to the first rebellion the dark days something like that but I I definitely didn't think it would be about snow either yeah and And I was disappointed um definitely disappointed Mm -hmm. and I I wasn't fully convinced that Susan and Collins was gonna do it do it right Mm-hmm. Um, yeah I was worried not as worried as some other people there was definitely people who were like I'm not gonna read it or she's gonna make us feel yeah sorry for snow and it's gonna be awful and blah 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 whatever I was just worried <laughs> but mm-hmm. still still kind of optimistic hopeful yeah I think I felt the same way like in the end I knew I was gonna read it no matter what I was just like in the moment seeing that it was about snow and especially at the time it came out or was planning to come out ended up being like the beginning of quarantine pretty much May of 2020. It was just a very chaotic time I think politically in the United States with everything going on and so Mm -hmm. I was kind of nervous about that and I think I was just worried too because for me I kind of thought of it like to kill a mockingbird because harper lee had that book come out and it was like the standalone book and then everything happened with like when she passed away and something about them finding the sequel to to kill a mockingbird and i remember like reading the second one i forget something about watchmen um in the night or something yeah and i remember just like putting it down like I might have read a chapter or something, but it's like, I didn't want it to ruin like what a classic was. And like, to me, The Hunger Games is like my own personal classic. Like, obviously I love Mm -hmm. it and it means so much to me. And so I was so like anxious about it. I remember even just driving to get the book with my sister. I was like so anxious, butterflies in my stomach all morning because I didn't know what I was going to read. And I didn't even know like, what that experience was going to be like opening it up years later from a different perspective, you know? Yeah. So many times sequels, prequels, they're just disappointing. And I was very, I was very nervous as well. Mm -hmm. So what did you think when you were reading it? I mean, Mm -hmm. were, were you happy with it or, or not your initial reaction when you were finished? Okay, so my reading, my first reading of it, I've only read it once, um, was a roller coaster. So I remember the first day I got it, I read about 100 pages on the first day. And I think it was because I was just so excited. I started speed reading. Like, I mean, that's speed reading for me because I can't really read too fast. Um, But I remember getting to about like page 50 and be like, okay, when is this going to pick up? I'm having such a hard time with it. And then it got to the point where I reached like, 100 pages in and then it became more of a chore to read it but I was like look you gotta gotta work your way through the book you know starting books is a really hard thing and got to part two and then the games happened and I was just so disappointed with the games and I know people will hate me for saying that and the reason why but first time reading it I just wasn't comfortable it was something so different from the original series and like we understand why now but once I got to the end of the games I was almost like fed up with it I think that's when I got really angry with Suzanne because it was no longer me trying to get into it to enjoy it it was me trying to get into it just to finish it and I was like well what could we have a whole part three about you know like him being a peacekeeper and I just had that is my least favorite part I hated it I had to like drag my feet reading it and so once I finished it 
I thought it was just a load of garbage, if I'm being honest, <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> but over time, like I've sat with it and especially doing research for it this past week, I think it it will never be my favorite book at all. Um, but I think it does add what it needs to add. And I think it like after sitting on it for literally months and months and talking to other tributes about it, um, I kind of get it. And so I'm excited to reread it and pick up on that a little bit more. But yeah, I was just, I hated it. <laughs> First read. I definitely did not hate it. <laughs> yeah. So totally, maybe not totally different feelings because we talked about some problems that we have with it that, that are the same. But I listened to the audiobook. So maybe that helped because I thought, um, gosh, I, for, I forget the name of who reads it, but he does a pretty good job, I think. Actually, there's a lot of hate for the audiobook, but I thought he did, he did great. Um, so I was just listening to it at the pace that I was, and I didn't really pull all-nighters or anything like at the beginning. I was just listening to a little bit of it each day, and I really liked part one a lot mm -hmm. um just seeing the capital and I don't, just a totally different perspective in Panem that was just fascinating to me and all these like little details that we were getting the games part is actually was my least favorite part of the book part two because we weren't in the arena so I just felt kind of detached and then there were so many characters that were dying and I just didn't feel a connection with them really yeah. and there were so many characters all these different names for both the, the tributes and the mentors it was hard to keep track I was really glad that there was that list that kept xing off people mm -hmm. <laughs> as they got out of out of the the games because I it was so hard to keep up I thought and then when I got to the end of part two I was just shook. I was shook so much. I had, I just did not anticipate it going in that direction. Mm -hmm. And it was probably like one in the morning when I got to that cliffhanger at the end of part two. And I was like, I can't, I can't go to bed. I have to, I have to keep reading this. So I stayed up the rest of the night oh my gosh. <laughs> finishing part three because it, for me, it got exciting. Um, I guess it, it did die down a little bit when we got to District 12 and it was kind of like, okay, where is this going from here? Yeah. Um, but then Sejanus shows up and then I just became really happy again. <laughs> Yay, we love him. Yeah. And then we got to the end and the end was fantastic. Did you love it? Like when you finished it, what were your emotions? S distress, just distraught. Mm. I, I, I don't know, I couldn't even con contain my emotions. I was crying. Really? At the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You cried? Mm hmm I was like, set it on my table. I was like, good night, world. Like, <laughs> I, I was, I cried, but I think it was also like angry tears. Mm -hmm. Because Snow, mm -hmm. I, just, I just hate him. There was definitely a certain point in the book where I started calling him Snow. I don't know, it felt yeah, like he's no. a totally different character. I was calling him uh, uh, Coriolanus up until, uh, I, I forget what point, but there was definitely a, a turning point for mm -hmm. me. And then I was like, okay, this is snow. This is the snow that we know. Yeah, I read that on, I was reading like Tumblr theories last night and someone said, it's almost like there is a point where he's Coriolanus and then he's snow. And so- yeah, I complete like I agree with that, and I don't think I picked up on that. I was just so irritated <laughs> he by just him. Fully flips that switch mm -hmm. and doesn't go back. Mm -hmm. um, for the notes that we wrote this week about it, um, we're kind of talking a little bit about snow, so I'm just gonna skip to like one of my theories I have about snow. Okay. I think that snow. Okay, I have two theories. So the first one is, and I think we can both agree on it, is snow should be like. A diagnosed narcissist because it is clear reading this book we're not even reading it from his point of view it's third person but his actions reflect 
just complete narcissism in himself and what he thinks is best for him. And he also thinks like snow lands on top over and over again. I think that just kind of demonstrates how he believes he's the greatest good for everyone else. And I think like rating it as a, like what, what we know about him from being a president, we don't quite know that much about his character, but I think after reading this, I would say that he's definitely like a narcissist. Oh, totally. Yeah. So I feel like everyone can agree on that, which I think is amazing that Suzanne wrote him this way because you mentioned it before, but um, when, when she announced that she was writing this book about snow, everyone was like, Oh, are we going to all feel sad for snow and have this sad, tragic villain backstory? It's not that tragic. I mean, there's points where it is upsetting. No. Like at the beginning, he he might lose his house. Mm-hmm. Like they're not always sure about food or whatever. But he doesn't care so much about being on the streets, mm-hmm. I think, as, as being the top of the, the social ladder. Well, exactly. Like his reputation is what matters the most to him. And so, yeah, I think everyone like you said you hated him when you finished the book everyone hated him I think that's why reflecting on my reactions from the first read I was so negative about it was because I like reading books about characters I like and so it's hard for me to read a book and to like enjoy the book without enjoying the characters in it at least one or two of the main characters and so for me I just couldn't get through it with with snow and I think it's clear to me why and Suzanne did her job so mm-hmm. I'm not trashing you Suzanne I'm trashing him <laughs> yeah uh, I think it's great she never went that route of of making us feel bad for him it, mm-hmm. it's more a story of okay here's this guy and he's already not great he's not really a good person mm-hmm. but then how does he become you know really evil yeah And I think it is his narcissism. There's points, I think, we're planning to do a read-along, by the way, for everyone who's listening on Instagram, um, a ballad read-along. But there's going to be so many points in time where I'm going to bring up, look, this is where he's the narcissist. But the next theory that I had um, is kind of different. And as we do the read-along, I feel like I can prove it more. But um, I'm going to be open and tell everyone that I actually am diagnosed with OCD. So like, I know what OCD is and I've had it for a lot of my life, but I would argue that Snow also has some form of OCD because in the way that he is written and the way that his actions are, I feel like he has this sense of control all the time that he needs to like obtain. Um, And if we, if you guys join us for the read alongs, I'd love to show you all the points where I picked up on that. But as I've been like reading the first few chapters, He's very particular in everything he does in like a way that I've always been. So like that's how I've related to Snow. But I really think that he has OCD, like some form or level of OCD. Interesting. I don't yeah. know that much about OCD. So I can't wait to hear that. <laughs> so, the, little, yeah. the little points. But that was something like, I mean, like I've been reading it the first few chapters and I told you I was taking notes. But yeah, I don't know if it's meant to be there, but just in the way that his actions are very repetitive and very controlling, I think kind of plays into like who he is. And maybe that's like part of the reason why he is the way that he is. So I thought I'd bring that up. I guess there were a lot of new characters Mm -hmm. in Ballad, um, a couple familiar ones and a lot of name drops. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But who was your favorite character in the book? Okay, my favorite Every, I feel like everyone's gonna say this it's I really okay the first time I read it I hated Lucy but I really enjoy Lucy now um, and I'm excited to see how she is in the movie but I would pick Sejanus and Lucy I can't pick between the two but hmm. I think I like those two what about you Sejanus yeah <laughs> we have to ask to make it fair you know <laughs> hey but Sejanus because he's wonderful and is just sticking up for for what he believes in and he just has such a pure heart oh my gosh I love but Sejanus something that I when I was reading Sejanus oh no oh no don't knock Sejanus no no no, no I'm not maybe I will be <laughs> um something that I picked up on him was that he reminds me a lot of Gail 
And I found that really fascinating. I don't know if you agree with it at all. No, I see it. I see but it. The I difference thought... between PETA and Sejanus, I, like PETA is, I think, smarter than Sejanus. He has a yeah. little bit more social awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, he, like he knows when is the right time to speak up and when's the right time to act, where Sejanus, he, he just doesn't. Yeah. Um, and it leads to his downfall. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas I, I don't think Peta would have trusted Snow. Yeah. In the same way, he would have he would have picked up on, you know, I don't. There's something wrong here. Mm-hmm. Whereas Sejanus didn't, which led to his unfortunate demise. So sad. Yeah. Is I that think, what's similar to Gail? Or I think to me, it's just the fact that Sejanus and Gail both re- both represent this. Um, desire for goodness and for like they have this intense passion for a revolution that supports human rights I think that they just have that fire in them that is mentioned with Gail over and over again because he is so set on saving the world around him and the and Pan Am and I think that Sejanus sees that the same way that Gail would see that so I could definitely see them being friends if they lived in the same timeline um but it's interesting to me like he does have points of PETA's personality like again we we agree that they're both ENFPs and so I think that they're both very similar in terms like PETA and Sejanus in the ways that they express themselves and think but at the same time I think when it comes down to the core personality Sejanus more so represents like a shadow of Gail's character Mm. It's kind of like a Peta Gale mm-hmm. mix. Yeah. Which is fascinating. But Gale is willing to to go to any length for change, right? And I don't think Sejanus I think is. he is. I mean, he ends up dying because of it. I don't think he's as mature but as Gale was at the time. But, I mean, he's the one who ran into the arena. He would try to do anything for his tribute. Um, Marcus, but right? he's he's much more compassionate. And that's that PETA side. So I think that it's like a blend between Gail and PETA. But again, I think he would go to that length and sacrifice himself to make the world around him a better place. I, I think feel like that's very Katniss-like, though. Katniss is very much a mix of yeah. PETA and Gail. Yeah, that's true. But I, I would say Katniss is more selfish. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, she wouldn't be running into there into the arena for any reason if she were a mentor because she's still got her family she's mm-hmm. still you know she's got people to protect whereas Sejanus is just gonna go for it yeah so I definitely agree like the compassion comes from PETA and the the selflessness but Gail is also very selfless in a sense so I think whenever he's passionate about something it shows in his actions and I think Sejanus is very similar to that so it's, it's interesting that you love him, but I th- I'm so excited. Like we said, I just need to know what this boy looks like because I know he's going to look good. So <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, Actually, I have another favorite character. Okay. Dr. Gall. <laughs> like your favorite. I'm scared. As in- <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared. Favorite <laughs> as in like such like a well-written character and and me just being terrified of her yeah I think Suzanne probably had such a fun time writing this because it's not just a political political leader who is very twisted and in control like snow or coin it's like like she takes a quote from Frankenstein at the beginning of the book and I think she was definitely going off of that fantastical science fiction bad evil villain so I think she had fun writing that Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just, I'm terrified of Dr. Gall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Snow, I, she's just such a good villain, I think. Mm-hmm. I think. I think she's a better, better villain than President Snow because in, in the trilogy, because Snow, I don't think I was ever really, it's like, I'm terrified of what he stands for and what he represents, but the specific things that Dr. Gall says and, and does, I'm just like, oh gosh. Yeah, I think I think he's definitely like I said she's more of the like fantasy evil villain because it's like 
turning clemencia is that how you say her name into the mutt Mm -hmm. you know like that's horrifying but snow it's like it's more so what your actions will do and then the repercussions from your actions you know what i mean so i I hope it there is that fantastical element Mm -hmm. in the movie because that was really downplayed in the movie trilogy especially Mm -hmm. like if you think about the mutts in the first arena yes not looking like the dead tributes yeah like like it needs to be that intense it needs to be creepy yeah because I think that definitely and reading the the lizard mutts that kill Finnick reading them in the book and experiencing them in the movie was completely different for me and so Mm -hmm. yeah I definitely hope that they bring that that would be I just want to be scared I want to be scared (laughs) it's such a good movie with just seeing Clemencia like slowly turning into that like snake reptile creature (sighs) and the last time he sees her in the hospital that's a scene that needs to be in the movie I want to see it (laughs) oh that'd be so cool but okay your least favorite character is something that you started to bring up do you have a least favorite um I don't know if I have a least favorite character um okay I'm gonna I'm gonna be a terrible person and say Lucy (laughs) um I I don't know if it's a popular opinion or probably an unpopular opinion I just didn't really like her very much I kept comparing her to Katniss Mm -hmm. I guess which I shouldn't have done because they're not the same person but I think Lucy made me miss Katniss a lot. Yes, yes. So I didn't like that. That's exactly how I felt when I read it. Like, I thought she was annoying. I was just like, girl, you need to be quiet because Katniss was the real girl from District 12, like the real tribute. You know what I mean? Like, reading it and reading the reaping, I think that was the scene that I got so turned off from the books was the District 12 reaping. I just don't know what it was, but something about how over the top it was for me it was almost like it was Suzanne was trying too hard to get our attention it was like I I don't remember much of the context that like I just ran through the reading so when I read there's a snake involved and she starts singing on stage and blah, blah blah I'm like what is happening like this is not a reaping that I think would actually happen That was something that I was like, too. it's too theatrical for me. Yeah, she's so like overly confident. Mm -hmm. I just just don't vibe with her personality, I guess. Yeah. Um, And she's she's manipulative. And she's just, Mm -hmm. she's kind of boring too. I just don't, Lucy's not my fave. I, I definitely felt that, like I despised her when I read it. And I think going back and like sitting on it for a while and then reading different fan theories, I think I, obviously I listed her as one of my favorite characters. I think I like her a lot more. And right now I can't really put it into words. It's just like a feeling like she's marinating in my head right now, like months and months after reading this, just how she reacted with snow and how she was able to survive this arena what did she do afterwards I think I'm just so interested in like the mystery of her and what we don't see um and just how she's connected to snow this most powerful man of Penham is what he's become you know or what he becomes so I'll definitely be interested to see if my because I'm sure my feelings will change a little bit Mm -hmm. um how much I don't know for a reread Mm -hmm. so I'm interested to at least go in with different expect like knowing who Lucy is yeah and just paying more attention to her character and like soaking it in and not focusing so much on wow I wish this was Katniss yeah no and I think everyone felt that way well I'm sure a lot of people did first reading it because what I loved about it was when we read the original three it was talking about how there had only been two victors before from District 12 before Katniss and Peeta and we know Hamish, but now we know why we don't know who Lucy was. The fact that the tape was erased and it's pretty much like Dr. Gall was like, this is just the worst thing ever. We're going to erase it from history. 
And so I think that's another reason why, like after reading it, I found it so fascinating because we just, she's literally erased. I just want to know everything about her at that point. It's just, again, the mystery of her. Which it's interesting to think about then that things in the game started to change that year. Yeah. So the games, when you're watching them, you're watching the ninth games and they're one way. And then watching the 11th games, which come next, and there's all these new things introduced. And it's Mm -hmm. probably closer to the games that we read about in the original trilogy. Mm -hmm. Just that jump. Yeah. I feel like like people would be suspicious and be like, what? What happened between games uh, nine and 11? Yeah, definitely. Because did they renumber the games? Probably. That's why I was wondering, a big thing I was curious about was why didn't they just erase the first 10 from history? And then say- Maybe they did. But why would you call it 74 if it's 64 then? You know what I mean? Like, that was something I'm like, I don't get that because- I don't like and then for me when I was reading about the games because again I went back and looked at like the 10th hunger games people are saying you can confirm this I don't know if it's true or not that Megs was the victor of the 11th games and that's confirmed like canon is that canon yeah she's the games right after so I didn't I didn't remember fascinating and I'm just like thinking about all of that because in that like you said it's just a jump from 9 to 11 and then even from 10 to 11 There's the first victory tour, there's um, mentors outside of like students, you know, Um, what else was there? Maybe they just got rid of the first nine tapes as well. Mm -hmm. They're just like, oh, they're they're too old. They were lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was no tracking of the tributes, which is something I hated about this game. Like the 10th games was just the fact that we didn't even know what was going on in them. You know, no, we didn't know where they were yeah or like it's hidden somewhere. somewhere yeah <laughs> the tracking the cameras the fact that we only had like one or two main cameras that showed what was happening um and how that changed the next year I mean the 10th was the first time the mutations were released into the arena and the fact that it only lasted five days where when you look and see like Katniss's games last a couple weeks so just how fast it goes you know like that's just a huge leap but I think to me that's probably the part that I loved the most about Valid was I was reading it which I know I shouldn't have gone into it reading it this way but I was reading it for things that helped me learn more about Panem instead of about Snow like I wanted to learn more about the history of the games about the capital about the rebellion you know what I mean like I was more intrigued by what building off of things we already knew, not new things completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess like, because we had a question, what's the coolest new thing that we learned? And it it wasn't like any particular one thing for me. It was just that first section of the book, learning about how different the games were. Mm -hmm. Just literally throwing tributes into like an arena, like a literal (laughs) arena. Like, (laughs) and the fact that they just arrived by this random train they were okay. starving sick to me, to me the zoo part though was a little bit over Too the top much. I it agree yes fetched. like yes. kind of how you were saying the the reaping was like a little over the top like just didn't seem believable I don't think that they that really would have happened I don't just, think so either it doesn't seem realistic to me at all it's cheesy it's like mm-hmm. okay really and then when the little kid was at the at the zoo and I, I forget the line exactly, but something about them being animals or like trying to feed them or something. Mm-hmm. I was just like, I don't think this just doesn't seem realistic to me. I mean, yeah. And like, I know that the capital was going through like war reparations and fixing things up, but you could at least put them in a hotel or something. You know what I mean? You would at least have, if you have such intense security around Panem with the peacekeepers. How are you telling me that you don't have security for a group of 24 kids that you're planning to make this huge deal out of? Like the Hunger Games was the biggest deal after the dark days because it was the way that the capital took control of the district. So you're telling me you don't have any security or any place to put these kids 
and to call them animals is like too literal for call, me. I, yeah it's like hitting us over the head yeah which i mean suzanne isn't the most subtle she author do that. but like not like that yeah no <laughs> they're I, animals so we put them in a zoo like okay yeah it, that was a little far-fetched for me i agree um that's why i was really skeptical reading about that and the fact that like going into the games they don't feed them like again you're trying to make a show out of this the basic thought process there would to be take care of the kids until they can kill each other like right well at that point they're not it's not really this reality show right but at the same time like basic amenities though like I guess they didn't really care if they died before or after or like once they were in the arena I don't know I just the fact that they are like they see them as animals and put them in the zoo like I'm never gonna get over that (laughs) yeah I remember reading that being like okay um (laughs) oh Suzanne (laughs) let's cut it out but I mean reading the books one thing that I was happy with was that it it felt like reading Suzanne Cullen's writing yes yeah and I know I've said one of my favorite things about the Hunger Games is the first person present tense. Mm-hmm. And so I, when I knew that it was going to be in third person, I was really worried because I didn't think it would feel like reading a Hunger Games book. But somehow, even being in third person, her writing style was still so similar that that was enough for me. And it, it felt like reading Hunger Games. Yeah. So I was happy with that. Yeah, the big pro was the the chapter endings for me. <laughs> she yes, yes. her sentence chapter endings, and I'm like, okay, Queen, I love it. Um, but back to the shocking moments. This is not like a big moment. I listed a few, but I w- it's one of the moments I remember reading the book and then setting it down and be like, oh my goodness, so excited. It's from chapter 27, and it's a quote, and it relates to. Um, the interview that we talked about with Suzanne and David a few Mm -hmm. weeks ago. And so the quote is for eating in a few weeks, these will grow into decent sized potatoes and we can roast them. said Lucy Gray. Some people call them swamp potatoes, but I like Katniss better has a nice ring to it. I was like, I literally sat the book. I was at work reading and I was like, this is awesome. And then I, (laughs) now that, that, now that I know about the swamp potato reference, I was like, Suzanne got her reference in there. She yes, made her dreams come true. Swamp potato Katniss. <laughs> swamp potato Everdeen. I could just picture her sitting at her computer being like, swamp potato Everdeen. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But I remember just reading Lucy Gray specifically mention Katniss and being like, okay, wait a minute. I kind of like this. <laughs> it just makes me think about her writing ballad while she was doing that interview Mm. dropping hints yes (laughs) I know um but like in terms of real shocking moments I would say both Clemencia becoming a mutt because that was disturbing and disgusting and awful and I wanted to like have a shower after I read that because it was just like disturbing to me (laughs) and I liked how somebody one of the some fan called it like the final hunger games between snow and lucy at the end because they're literally like out to get one another um and so that whole end sequence between lucy and snow is just something that was shocking to me i would say two of the most shocking part i mean there were there were a lot of yeah. little things because that's just suzanne but we were talking about this in a text thread earlier but arachne when she gets Mm -hmm. killed i just i just didn't expect that it's like you don't expect them to die before getting into the arena and for me it was like okay welcome welcome back to the world of the hunger games you know like Mm -hmm. it's just so intense especially with oh sorry i was just gonna say especially with the chapter ending i think it was a chapter ending too of course it was (laughs) Um, yeah, so that was shocking. And then I still, the end of section two, when Snow becomes a peacekeeper, was just so shocking. I think that was the most shocking moment of the book for me. Really? It was so unexpected. I was, 
like, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to finish this right now and see where this goes. Mm-hmm. It was just such a huge curveball. I, I loved it. Yeah. I think the end, the end for me was not really that, like I loved it and it felt very intense and, and very cinematic. That is going to be the best part of the movie mm-hmm. for sure. Um, but it didn't seem shocking to me because I knew, it's like, you know, that something's going to happen that yeah. he's gonna kill her or something like something's not gonna work out he's gonna leave her something so it's like you're just waiting for whatever the bad thing is gonna happen to happen at that point I just really liked it because for me Snow was someone who was able to maneuver his way out of trouble a lot of times and I think that's like one of the few moments where besides when he gets taken down as president in the original trilogy, he is taken over by a a young woman. Like Lucy Gray literally is almost kills him with the snake, traps him, confuses him. And in a sense, I felt like he had trusted her too much. And then again, he learns never to trust anyone again. But I also just love the complexity behind their relationship and how like, I don't even, did they love each other? Did they care about each other? Were there any feelings there? But she was almost just as smart as he was because you could argue that she was manipulating him just as much as he was manipulating her. And so I think that's one of his true, like the one, her and Katniss are the one of few people that have ever actually been able to at least try and take him down. Okay, let's talk about the end more okay. because, I mean, you said that she- she was manipulating him like do you think it was her intention I at the end I think she was fully trusting him and everything was good and then snow just I don't know I think led went you know was assuming mm-hmm. that things were gonna that she was gonna turn on him and I don't think that was true I think this is why I need to read it again because I've only read it once but from what I picked up, there was never full trust on either end. And I think that you could argue as you got to know her character more and more and her relationship with her ex-boyfriend and with the the mayor's daughter and just how she's not even from District 12. She was just, they were just traveling through with the cubby. I think that she's learned to survive and to manipulate people because of that in a way that she can I'm trying to think how to say this it's just like who she is I think that when she was reaped and it was rigged it was a rigged reaping she took that into her own hands and said like it's survival mode I don't know if I'm gonna live but the moment where she saved Snow's life and then is like you get me out of this arena like you owe me I I never felt like they loved each other. I felt like it was very complex. It was very back and forth. Um, Again, I think she manipulates him to help herself get out of the arena. He manipulates her to help him raise in the ranks. I don't know. It was never just like a true love or even just like actual love, you know, like not even like a soulmate end all be all love. And so for me, I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense, but I think it's just such a complicated relationship that they use each other. But in a sense, like there is a caring, but there's always this unease between them. And that's what I love about the third person is like, yeah, we don't trust Snow, but we also don't really trust Lucy ever. And I think I like that about her. Yeah, no, it is very complex. And it definitely it's interesting because more so than the original trilogy, it lends itself to everybody having their own opinion Mm -hmm. about who the characters are and and what they really think and feel, Mm -hmm. especially at the end. But I definitely think at the end, she's trusting him quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, because she wants him to go out there with her. She doesn't want to be alone. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was her plan to, like, kill him and go off without him. So. But it also wasn't his plan, too, to kill her until he found out. No, until he he was home free. Yeah. I just um, love how he goes out there and he's like, oh, this is disgusting. Like, I can't believe I have to live like this. Well, yeah, I think that's why I kind of compare it to like its own Hunger Games is because 
he's literally thrown out into nature, into the wild. That's kind of like what the tributes have to live through. And then all of a sudden it becomes this mental game of, do I trust this person? Do I get to go home? Do I get to live a life of freedom? And so I thought it was more of like, almost like a metaphorical games between the two of them as they learn the trust and he struggles to get out of there. It's just so funny. It's just going to look so good on film. Mm-hmm. They better do that scene. Just, it's going to be, I hope it's like pouring rain. Yes. It's like dark. It's, it's not raining in the book, right? That's just in my head. Yeah, <laughs> but it has to be, or just, and how like, I just hope it's it like muddy makes and you confused ah, to watch it too because yes. reading it it's not just like you know everything that's going on you're like you even though it's third person you okay like wait you're in the arena like where is where is but the killer? I don't want it to be confusing as in shaky cam no let's shaky cam. not let's not have the shaky cam no. I still want to be able to see what's going on <laughs> no I think it needs to be like the end of um the 75th games where Katniss is like, what is going on? And like, if you hadn't read the book, you're like, why is Johanna attacking her? Blah, blah, blah. They need to, except they need to drag it out more because the confusion wasn't set long enough in the movie for me in Catching Fire, like it is in the books. They need to have at least like five to five minutes of pure confusion in the movie. That's all I ask. Okay, but at the end, when you hear Lucy talking and he's like trying to find her and shooting at her, Mm-hmm. Do you think she's really there saying those things? I don't know. Because I, I think he's going mad and I just imagining think... it. I don't think she's there. I think she's gone. I think she's running off. Like, she's not even close. He's mm-hmm. just there by himself in the mud, in the rain, shooting around in circles. Which I want to see. Yes. Like, <laughs> see a very confused snow just shooting, like, randomly. But, it's gonna be so good <laughs> but I, again like I don't know because I wouldn't consider snow mad ever no but like for a for a minute there yeah I don't know like I need to reread it because I don't really remember what I was thinking when I read that part but again I don't think he's mad I think he's a sociopath a narcissist but it would be interesting I don't think he, she's there saying that stuff to him so I don't know Do you think, what do you think happens to Lucy? The big question. Girl, let me get into my theories. (laughs) The biggest theory we all know is that um, Lucy Gray is Katniss's grandmother and her son would have been Katniss's dad. But that's hard to believe because there's no way she could have gone back to District 12 and lived a life and not ever been seen again. You know what I mean? Other theories say that she ran off to 13 and maybe she was in 13, but I doubt that again because she would have been a bigger character in Mockingjay. I think that she probably ran off into the woods and either died or found a way to survive for a while. Um, I don't think she was killed, but I think that she lived because that's what she did was she traveled around, you know what I mean, with a covey, so... We're actually on the same page about that then, which I'm surprised about. I just, some of the theories, I just tend to not believe in outlandish theories. Like, I just think that they're pretty outlandish for her to have made it to District 13, Mm -hmm. to District 12, in a disguise or under a different name or whatever. I think he doesn't kill her. Mm -hmm. She goes off and eventually I feel like she just dies alone Mm -hmm. out there in the wilderness which is pretty sad but I think that's what happens okay that could happen and also with district 13 if you think about it there's no way that could have happened because say she lived there and like survived to the age that she was in Mockingjay like she would have told Katniss who she was because at that point she's untouchable what's going to happen to her she can just be better bait for snow. You know what I mean? She could just piss him off even more by appearing in a propo or once she got to district 13, she could even tell them maybe she died at a younger age, but people would know about her because there's no reason to hide your identity in district 13. I definitely would not have liked it either. If she ended up being a character that was then in Mockingjay that talked to Kat and it's like, it would have just been another connection that, Mm -hmm. I just don't feel like the story needs. Yeah. 
But something that I just came to my mind was maybe she did run off into the woods. Maybe people from the cubby came and found her. Maybe she met up with someone. Maybe she stumbled across like a different country. I don't know. But what if, okay, just brainstorming. Because I, oh. I really think that either Lucy Gray or Maud Ivory is related to Katniss. And so if we're saying Lucy Gray is, maybe she had a son who is, or who is Katniss's dad. And then maybe she didn't really raise him much. Maybe she was just kind of like raised him in the woods at a very young age with like someone else. And then at a particular age, like dropped him off in District 12 in the scene. And then, because we don't know anything about his backstory. Like, we don't know anything about his parents. But I don't know. Maybe she is her grandma in some way. I don't know. Either I that think or she's Maud. definitely related to Maude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I think. I think there's more evidence to prove Maude. But I think everyone was so excited when Ballad came out that that's why that theory came out right away. But Maude definitely, like, they talk about how she has this talent to remember songs right away. That's like Katniss and her dad. They Katniss mentions in the first book, I believe, that after listening to a song or a melody once or twice, she learns the song immediately, which is just like Maud. Um, Katniss and her dad were singers. Um, we don't hear about anybody else singing in District 12. Again, they're from the seam. And then it comes down to like, if you, if you do... The logistics of the seam and the merchants, there's like half and half, perhaps. So 5,000 people in District 12 are from the seam. So there has to be some connection. And like Snow would have, wouldn't have gone back and killed Maud Ivory or anything. She could have lived under a fake name and like grown up and looked different. But I definitely think that, and the fact that they know the lake house too, like, how, and they live so close to mm -hmm. the entrance to the woods yeah it's not like people would be moving around and so no nope. yeah I definitely think that she put in the lake house to kind of symbolize somebody here is related to Katniss and her dad because again no one else knows about that, that place. knowledge yeah mm -hmm. just goes through the family yeah Which I like that looser more subtle mm -hmm. connection so much more yeah I agree because then it's like up to us to decide and make those connections but I think knowing Suzanne especially after we read the the interview with her I think it's just so obvious that she she thinks she's being very clear but then again like she's trying to get her point across like look the game maker who was tossed into the the punch bowl was was um what's his name Plutarch. Was, was Plutarch I was gonna say Claudius was Plutarch like it's all these like little hints towards things where she's like obviously I'm making a ton of sense right here so I mean like the, the facts are here she's distinctly made the comment about the singing about the lake house about Katniss as a root as a plant and so I'm kind of like there is some connection there I feel like she's almost screaming at us but I like like you said how she doesn't make it that explicit and that she's never going to make it clear for us. I like it, though. She's never going to tell us. Yeah, because again, I mean, like, it's almost like Star Wars when you find out the definitive answer to who Ray is related to after you wait three movies for it, you know? It's kind of like, oh, mm -hmm. I like the secret, the mystery. I wonder if the movie is going to, I don't know, I don't know how they're going to, like, change it or certain lines are going to make us believe certain theories or, or not just sway how we feel so it'll be interesting to see how they interpret it yeah especially too because like I mentioned when Ballad first came out everyone was like Lucy Gray is so related to Katniss I was like no like, <laughs> no. like I don't know maybe, maybe it's time to like step back and think maybe not maybe it's Maud maybe it is Lucy Gray somehow I don't know but I think off of that, though, off of Lucy Gray and Katniss's potential connection, another issue I had with the book itself was kind of like you talked about, Kat, like you were looking for Katniss and Lucy Gray. I think that these little connections at points almost made me frustrated with Lucy's character a lot more because, I don't know, I think Suzanne went out of her way to make her more over the top than Katniss and that's something that I didn't like as well yeah I mean she needed to make her different 
but she didn't really because they have a lot of similarities like not personality wise but just how many little connections I don't know that also kind of frustrated me I think Mm -hmm. well just the fact especially when we went to district 12 and there was the hub and and we were talking about like the lake and the lake house and just going to all these places that Katniss was in it just seemed so too so convenient and Mm -hmm. heavy-handed to me which I just don't feel like Suzanne is in the trilogy so Mm -hmm. I just didn't get it I was frustrated and like we were talking about before more than just Katniss and Lucy but the the name drops and the connections between characters like you were talking about the Caesar Flickerman connection and how the Flickerman in this novel is a weatherman it's Mm -hmm. like really really Yeah. yeah and then like the Crane family is mentioned and the Cardew family is mentioned. And then again, Heavensby. Yeah, Heavensby we Hall. We know all the names of the tributes. Like you said, it's just, it gets so messed up in your head. Then you also know all the names of the mentors on top of it. It's so like, how the heck am I supposed to keep all of this straight while reading it? Like, please tell me. And then on top of that, you have the characters from District 12 and the Covey and like, all these obscure names with like colors and I'm like girl do you not understand this is just getting too complicated and I think you're getting too excited with the Greek names and the weird names I'm just like really which like we were talking about in the interview episode how she's so restrained in the original trilogy and only gives us what we absolutely need to know and I just didn't feel like that with valid at all which probably dropped 50 pages just based off of how long their names are honestly (laughs) oh no (laughs) right was off of what you just mentioned about it being so convenient with Katniss it kind of made this book I had a hard time with it because it made Katniss less special to me and I've tried to like push that trauma away Mm -hmm. like as in she's the only one like her and Gail but the only one that she goes out and she's hunting and yeah I think it's more like the fact that it's too personal for Snow I like the idea of Katniss being that girl picked from the masses and being the girl who is from this poor district is from literally nothing has saved herself has saved people around her by chance I don't like that it was set up and the fact that Lucy Gray was pretty much went through very parallel experience to Katniss in terms of how absurd her raping was her connection to Snow like when Snow first saw Katniss volunteer people are like I want to see how he would have reacted now that I know that Lucy Gray was his first love and such an important part to him it's like, well, what about Katniss just being that revolutionary character? I don't think that, I think it almost like devalues her as a character and what she accomplishes just based off of Snow's weird connections to literally her whole past, literally the lake house, literally hunting in the woods, literally the hob, literally, like, why wouldn't he have gone back and destroyed all of that? Why did the lake house still exist? Why did Katniss? live in the ghost of snow's past life in district 12 you know what i mean i think it just completely devalues katniss and i hated Mm -hmm. that no i totally agree with that like why did these things still exist (laughs) yeah because he would have he would have gotten rid of them for Mm -hmm. sure but i mean I, i don't think it's unreasonable that there's this unique reaping you know it's not like it was five years before Katniss it was 65 years right so I think that's plenty of time to go by before something you know a blip in the system comes along again but it's also at that time there'd only been or if you look at district 12 there's only four victors from district 12 and two the two girls who are pretty much okay yeah, yeah have the weird like stand up to the capital, stand up to power situation with snow. So I just want Katniss to be able to volunteer for her sister to change everything to revolutionize the country without snow having some weird past connections to her in odd ways. Like 
the fact that Lucy Gray is also from the same and is a victor from District 12 and is a young female and has same qualities and all this connection to District 12. I'm like, it's, it takes away Katniss's actions in the books. And so... Yeah, it does make it feel like she shines a little less brightly. Yeah, which I didn't like because it's just like, I think I, when I finished it I felt like Suzanne was almost hoping to get a reaction out of us like look what I gave you it's what you wanted right and I was like no it's not what I wanted because that's why there was all the name dropping and connections to capital characters and that's why there's yeah, this I weird just... connection between Katniss and Lucy Gray I'm like no that's not what I wanted at all I want it to be completely different I don't I want it to be a coincidence that Katniss volunteered. I don't want the two girl tributes from District 12 and Victor's to be the exact same people. I don't know. That's why I was really upset with Suzanne. I'll always be upset about that. I feel like a lot of that stuff is probably added in after as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think she set out to give us something that we wanted necessarily. I think she probably, once she knew she was going to like publish this, then started adding all these connections and maybe that's why they feel forced because they didn't need to be there and mm -hmm. they weren't really meant to be but maybe she thought that she had to on top of the story that she was writing had in all these connections like after the fact yeah I mean that's why I like that one quote about the small potatoes and Katniss because it's like it's so so little it's so small it has no significance to the plot but then all these connections between characters and relationships between Lucy and Katniss, it's just like, really? And then it, it just is weird to me how it just changes how I view Snow and Katniss's relationship later on because he's looking at her like Lucy Gray probably less than we used to see him as looking at her like Katniss. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't think if I read the trilogy again, I would really be thinking about Ballad. I would, especially the catching fire scene where he goes to her house. Because again, like Ballad, you learn that Snow is never going to lie again because he has that, he learns his lesson never to lie from, from Lucy and from Dr. Gall, or no, from Dr. Gall because of the, the assignment thing where he put his hand in the tank and got bit or Clemencia got bit it's like from that point on it's like he never lies or he works on never lying and then that's his rule with Katniss is don't lie to me yeah I think so much relates back to it I guess it's kind of like I don't think she knew any of this when she was writing the original trilogy mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't really read it any differently like it's fun to read the first book but I don't I don't feel like it actually informs anything that happens in the trilogy <laughs> or yeah but the Lucy Gray thing does that's where I'm stuck at I like, like the line it does, part, but I feel like the first book is or the ballad is interesting and it's a cool read and we get to learn things about the games that we didn't know before but I just don't really, I don't think I'm going to be really reading the trilogy and thinking about it because I know that none of that actually existed when she was initially writing the series. But then so, it, it was written into existence because she went back and wrote Ballad. You know what I mean? Like she, yeah, she could have uh, yeah, written know, Lucy Gray just, completely different. Like she could have changed it a lot more so that she wasn't so similar to Katniss. I don't even know. I'm, I'm, I will always be upset that Lucy Gray was from 12, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't understand why she didn't make her from a different district. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's like she tried to make it too perfect for us as fans. You know? And the yeah. fact that she's not just from 12. She's from the scene. And she's living in the same neighborhood area that Katniss lived. It's like the connections the same, go you know on, what I mean? and on and on. Yeah, so <laughs> that, like... I was so excited to talk about Ballad, but now that we're talking about this part, it just makes me so not excited to talk about Ballad. <laughs> because I know, the, the connections will just forever frustrate me. Same. And, I, like, I appreciate Suzanne. I think she was really, like, trying to make 
an aha moment for the fans, maybe at some points between the connections she was building between Lucy Gray and Katniss. But it's not, I think it did the opposite. I think it was received really differently. Yeah, I still love it though. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll never say I love it. <laughs> I think I think when the movie comes out, I'm going to, I'm hoping it'll be my second favorite. I think it's going to be Catching Fire and then Ballad. Do you think, what is your thought on two movies? Do you think that's like too much to be split into two? No, I don't want two movies. Mm-hmm. It's It's not going to be anyway. We already have confirmation, so. Yeah, because I'm trying to think what would even fit into two movies. It would be weird, because especially because there's three parts, it would have to be, this is what would happen. It would be part one and part two would be the first movie, be the games, and then the second movie would be all of part three. Oh, which too long. would be a terrible movie. Like, no. Yeah. No. Okay. But something, okay, redeeming quality of Ballad is The Hanging Tree and Deep in the Meadow. I love, love, yes. love, love it, love Honestly, it. Honestly, all of the songs, mm-hmm. I love. It's going to be so, I'm going to be so <laughs> sad when they cut some of them out. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, like, which ones are they, are they going to keep and which ones are they going to cut out? Because if they left them all in, <laughs> this could be a musical. I'm literally hiding my face because no joke when I read the book I know I shouldn't have done this but I would see like the the song parts of it and just skip it and be like bye I was listening to the audiobook so yeah well I've gone back and watched like the YouTube videos about them and I like them more but in the book there's so many like you said that I'm just like oh I get to skip a page but that is one thing that it has excited me so much is seeing all of the rocking J, like all of the fan interpretations of the songs <laughs> yes has been amazing because there are some really good ones and it just reminds me so so much of the early days yes. of hunger games fandom where everybody was doing their own hanging tree deep in the meadow these songs and mm-hmm. and we didn't know what they really sounded like until the you know the movie's interpretation so I am thriving right now. <laughs> it really is. All like, the fan music. It really is a piece of nostalgia because you and I both joined the fandom back before like any of the movies came out. It was like the pre-hype to the actual, mm-hmm. like we didn't even know who actors were. Yep. And so we're pretty much getting to relive that right now where I, know, it's great. I have no idea who, what they're going to look like, who's going to play who. Like it's so, it's, it's really exciting. This is just that that sweet, sweet period where we have fan art, which is amazing. And y- you can just imagine the characters solely the way, you know, that you want to. And there's mm-hmm. fan music and people are making things and being creative in a way that once the movies come out, it'll be, which it's fine. I love them too. But video, like fan edits, mm-hmm. s- screenshots from the movies edits yeah. like that so it's just such a creative time I feel like in a fandom before a movie comes out and you never get that back yes which I'm so happy we get to at least relive one more time with the Hunger Games you know um, well I feel like that's I've covered most of the things that were my thoughts I mean until we get into like a maybe chapter by chapter talk mm-hmm. okay one last thing I want to talk about though really okay. fast was I never noticed when I first read it that there was all those quotes at the beginning, that one page where she quotes Thomas Hobbes, John Jacks. There were a lot of quotes. Like Mary Shelley and like, oh my gosh. And so I hope that when we do our read along, we should just like loop that in with one, like chapter one and talk about the quotes because that was so cool to me. And it makes Suzanne, it makes the book better to me, in my opinion, because it shows again the fascinating aspect of the history Suzanne draws from and all the names and it's just so cool yeah let's talk about it with chapter one yes so yeah join us guys we will be starting our live chats um they'll probably be weekly pretty soon so stay tuned for that and we'll talk valid more but I'm so glad I finally got to talk valid with you I'm so excited I know. (laughs) I still feel like we're probably going to keep spoilers off until we 
finish ballad, like another ballad read through, mm -hmm. so that if you haven't read ballad, you can read with us, and you don't you only have to skip this episode. Yeah, and then can come back. No more spoilers after this and the lies. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to get it all out. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So next week we are going to be talking about the Hunger Games movie trailers. And you'll get lucky and I'll recite one of them, maybe. <laughs> Holly, Holly did say that she could recite one from memory, so I'm, I'm taking you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. See you guys next week. Take care. Bye. Hey, Tributes. This is Holly. I wanted to thank you for watching this episode of Into the Arena and just wanted to also mention starting on March 13th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Emily and I will be doing our ballad read-along, so starting tomorrow, come to our Instagram at Into the Arena Podcast, reading chapters one and two, and join us for our book talk. So yes, thanks for watching this episode, and we hope to see you on our live chats. Thank you!